Well, if we're going to look back, uh, here are some examples of somewhat antique detectors. Uh, but uh, strangely enough, we can look at all these and quite easily understand their operation. And there are, in fact, uh, modern analogs of these instruments. You see on the left an electroscope, which is really nothing more than an ion chamber uh, designed to quantify the amount of ionization in air. Well, we still do that today in uh, many different forms in portable ion chambers used for health physics monitoring, for example. Uh, next to that is a Geiger tube. This was really the first of the sensors that were capable of pulse mode counting of a single quantum, either a single particle or a single photon. And that opened a, a, a great world of particle counting uh, to, uh, in the uh, field of nuclear physics. And so it played certainly a very important role at its time. We still have Geiger tubes. They still work in practically the same way. Uh, next to that is a proportional counter, you see, introduced in the 1940s. This, for the first time, permitted spectroscopic operation. Uh, the Geiger tube, of course, only provides uh, a yes or no answer. It either triggers or it does not. The proportional counter, on the other hand, can provide information on the amplitude of the pulse, therefore the amount of deposited energy. And then finally, on the right, is an example of a health physics instrument. Again, in this case, an ion chamber, where this is operated in DC, or current mode. And you see the, the uh, somewhat antiquated uh, readout. On the other hand, it is not very different in principle from the types of ion chambers that you would go out and buy today. So one of the messages that I want to get uh, across the, here is that that has the evolution of detectors uh, certainly is appreciable, but it is somewhat of an evolutionary process. And if you were to look at a plot of some measure of progress uh, in the in the world of radiation <laughs> sensors, I think you'd see this kind of behavior when plotted against time along the horizontal axis, there are somewhat abrupt steps in this plot where a new technology for the first time appeared. And between these steps are somewhat more gradual evolutionary periods where there are refinements made to these uh, uh, important new uh, abilities. And we already now saw several of these, the Geiger tube, <coughs> Proportional to, you notice uh, as time goes on, the ability to do spectroscopy enters. Uh, in the 1950 period, sodium iodide came on the scene and permitted for the first time the measurement of gamma ray energies in a solid medium of substantial volume. And so that was a great breakthrough in gamma ray spectroscopy uh, about in the year 1950. Following that, in the early 60s, came the semiconductor detectors. And they have continually uh, evolved and improved, clearly. Uh, one of the major steps in this process was the introduction of germanium. Now, in something like the late 60s, in the form of lithium drifted uh, germanium. Well, the lithium drifting has gone away. We now use hyperpure germanium. But in many ways, uh, the germanium de uh, behaves exactly as it did when it was uh, lithium drifted. Uh, and finally, I put one more step on here, just somewhat arbitrarily, uh, illustrating another breakthrough in energy resolution. And that are, those are the recent cryogenic bolometers uh, or microcalorimeters that uh, are, have exquisite energy resolution because they are no longer limited by the statistics of charge collection. So uh, although these are not yet uh, widely employed, they, in fact, break through a number of barriers that have always been there for competing techniques.
And there are certainly big steps in other conventional sensors. Here's one that I think has major impact. It is the introduction of a new material to central letters. It's about uh, almost 10 years old from its initial uh, disco uh, discovery. But it's now only recently coming on the scene in large volumes, such as this example, which is a three inch by three inch lantern bromide scintillator with absolutely breathtaking energy resolution. For any of you who are used to looking at sodium iodide, this is a spectrum that is 3% um, energy resolution at cesium-137. Now, the best you could do with sodium iodide might be twice that, 6%. So this is really now uh, entering a new world in, in scintillators. Uh, these are not yet widely deployed. Uh, they are very expensive. When I checked the price on uh, this example, it was something like $35,000. So it is a, a serious purchase, but there are applications where that kind of price can be justified because of their remarkably better energy resolution. Well, lanthanum uh, bromide is not the only example like this. There are other new scintillators appearing on the scene. This is one that has not yet made it into the commercial world, but shows great promise in research laboratories. It is strontium iodide. Uh, in this case, europium activated. And you can see again here, whoops, sorry about that. You can see the You can see the uh, remarkably good energy resolution again of 2.8%. Uh, these are small crystals at the, at the current stage. And part of the challenge is learning how to grow large volume crystals and retain this kind of uh, uh, performance. But lanthanum bromide has certainly stimulated many research laboratories around the world to look for new materials. Looking at scintillators was somewhat of a nascent field until, oh, 15 years ago, and no one bothered to spend much effort in trying to research new scintillation materials because it was widely felt that scintillation is an old technology. There's not much uh, new to be learned. That's turned out to be quite incorrect and there are more and more of these new materials appearing. And Dr. Hamada is one of those who is researching, in fact, some of these exciting uh, new materials. Here's another example of a class of materials that's gaining new attention. These are so-called El Paso lights. And there are many different uh, permutations of uh, material composition here. And so there's a rich area of exploration in varying the, uh, the uh, elemental makeup of these materials and also in uh, uh, their, uh, <coughs> their uh, degree of, uh, of activation with uh, generally cerium as the activator. So these are, again, a, a new family. They're just within the last year or two uh, being uh, explored. I think they have, again, great potential. Uh, this is uh, one of those. You can see the constituent elements involving cesium, lithium, lanthanum, and bromine. Again, some, some high Z elements, which certainly helps in gamma ray measurements. And again, very nice energy resolution. Um, unprecedented five years ago. Now that's the, a, a quick glance at sensors. And one of the points I wanted to make was that although some of these new materials are appearing on the scene, they still exploit the same technology that we saw back in the 50s, that is the generation of light within a solid material. So there has been evolutionary progress in the sensors. Um, I want to contrast